Okay, so we might uh, get started. So welcome everyone to the second instalment of the Grazing Scholars webinar series. My name is Victoria Lawrence and I'm part of the team at Maya Grazing. A couple of years ago, My Grazing and Gallagher began working together to form a synergy between the grazing infrastructure provided by Gallagher and Maya's grazing management software. From this partnership, we developed this webinar series, which is designed to provide practical information for a range of grazing management topics. Tonight, I'm joined by some experts in the grazing world to talk about uh, cover crops. From Gallagher, we have Jack Kyle and Cody Dvorak. Jack is a 31-year veteran provincial grazer with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Jack will take us through the benefits of utilising cover crops with a focus on soil health and some specific considerations when grazing cover crops. I'm also thrilled to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Peter Ballasted from Barenbrug. Dr. Ballasted was Oregon's forage extension specialist from 1986 until 1992 and has worked at Barenbrug USA since 2011 as their forage product manager. He is currently their forage ambassador, working with university and agency personnel throughout North America. He travels extensively, advocating for ruminant animal agriculture across several countries. Dr. Ballasted will be discussing the important characteristics of the three primary groups of foragers that can be utilised as cover crops. We'll have some time at the end for questions, so please don't hesitate to send those through in the Q&A chat box throughout the webinar. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jack Kyle from Gallagher. Thank you. So I'm going to talk initially about grazing cover crops, sort of why and how. So in, in feeding our livestock, perennial forages are our best forage option, but cover crops have become more uh, prominent in the last few years and they've been a way to fill in some of the blanks in the um, or short spaces in our feeding cycle. They provide extra feed. Um, we get improved soil health. There's lots of scientific work looking at how to improve soil health and having living ground cover for as much as possible of the year is, shows some very significant benefits in soil health. And if we're grazing a cover crop, it's going to be on land that was in an annual crop and so it's an opportunity to rest our perennial forage fields. And if we can give them some rest at any point during the grazing season, but particularly in late summer and early fall, we tend to strengthen those perennial forages. So you need to find the best fit for your farm. It's gonna depend on soil type, what type class of livestock you have and the feed needs and your cropping program and how cover crops can fit into that part of it. So soil, uh, living soil cover is beneficial. It enhances soil microbial activity, which increased my, microbial activity relates to increased release of nutrients for plant growth in the soil. And if we've got ground cover, we reduce the amount of erosion that takes place because that ground cover protects from uh, the impact of water, rain and running water, and it also protects from wind erosion. So we've got sort of a win-win situation there from a soil standpoint. Then the opportunity for extra feed, uh, reduce stored feed requirements is going to reduce your costs significantly. It costs about half of the value of stored feed is in the harvesting process. So pastured or grazed feed is about half the cost of stored feed. The advantage with pasture is all your nutrients stay in the field and the forage that's passed through the livestock is ready for soil microbes. The rumen's going to break down the cellulose and, and fiber that's in those the plant material and puts it in a form that's much more available to the, uh, to the soil microbes. So those, those are, in a nutshell, the benefits of grazing cover crops. And I think now we'll turn it over to Peter to talk about some of the crop opportunities that are there for cover crop grazing. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are, uh, you're joining us from. 
Um, my name is Peter Ballersted. I'm very glad to be a part of the Barenbrug company and very glad that Barenbrug is working together with leaders like Gallagher and Maya Grazing. I think it just uh, speaks to the power that we can assemble when we get all these various um, experts together from different industries to support forage-based agriculture. So I um, was very happy to have the introduction and forgive me, I'm just a little bit, oh, there it is, okay. There we go, excellent. Fumbling a bit with the technology. So just to make sure everybody is on the same page, I'm sure many in the audience are probably more advanced in this than I, but just to let you know the perspective that I'm coming from, cover crops are those plants that we grow for the protection and enrichment of the soil, as Jack just mentioned. We can use them to reduce soil erosion, increase water infiltration, reduce soil compaction. They can actually suppress the population of weeds in fields, and typically we're using grass and legumes and a broad group called forbs. Most people tend to think of brassicas. There are some other non-leguminous broad leaves that we can use. And Barenbrug has something to offer in each of these areas, but we'll also just talk generally. I'm slightly amused as a forage agronomist who's been around for a couple decades that a lot of what we're now seeing people get interested in, we used to talk in terms of short rotation crops, but as at least in North America, we've seen this specialization where animal agriculture got separated in operations from um, the the commodity cropping operation and so we don't we, we've gone through a period of time where we haven't had those kind of rotations and now they're coming back and in this case this is a picture that shows legumes in the way of vetch annual ryegrass as well as uh, brassica all in a mix that's being grown not for forage in this case but being grown as a cover crop during the non-crop portion of the growing year. And as a forage agronomist, I think grass hasn't gotten enough respect. And it's interesting to see the value of annual grasses being realized in cropping agriculture. A lot of what we've done over the last several years is kind of trying to treat symptoms rather than get back to causes. And when you've got all of this sediment entering sample, and this is one of the things that we've seen a lot of interest, especially when you start thinking about watershed health issues and you've got massive watersheds in North America that are now coming under varying degrees of concern for surface water quality. And perhaps you've all seen this kind of a display where you have this rainfall simulator and you have four simulated sods and this device is set up so that only the water that runs off will be collected. And you've got these one gallon jugs where you've had just conventional clean till sod, if you will, um, an overgrazed pasture, a well-managed pasture, and then a cover crop. Um, and in the time that we've accumulated a gallon of sediment laden water from the clean till and overgraze, the pasture has basically no runoff and only a third of a gallon roughly from the cover crop. So clearly this speaks to a couple things. One cover crop reduces the runoff, but well-managed pasture still beats everything, which I'll wave my hat and say, yay pasture. Um, but it's got to be well managed because 
the overgrazed pasture is as bad or worse than the clean till um, crop system. So management is critical and Jack will talk about that more in, in just a little bit. So clearly the, the cover crops, the short rotation forages will, and well-managed pasture will increase water infiltration, which means less runoff. And part of this was dramatically demonstrated for me. This is from South Central Nebraska. And we've got soil, same soil type, but it's been managed differently. So we have um, soil from a field that's been in conventional continuous corn for a long period of time, same soil type under a long period of grass cover. The technician in the left image has already dropped one clod into that water-filled column on that's furthest away from her. That one came from the cornfield. She just dropped a clod from the long-term grass field into the column that's closest to her. And you can already see that the soil clod from the continuous conventional corn is already releasing a great deal of small sediment, uh, almost like it's dissolving. There's been mechanical dislocation of smaller clods or peds off of the bigger ped in the grass column. But when we look 25 minutes later, we can see that essentially that large ped from the grass is still intact. The water's clear as compared to from the cornfield that there was no water stable structure. So that has broken down into smaller particles or is this, and is at the bottom of the column, or it's all suspended as silt in that water column. And so you can imagine that that soil won't be as porous, won't maintain infiltration, won't be as fertile, won't be um, as good for soil health characteristics as the one under grass. So grazing management's critical, having uh, more complex rotations and doing things to reduce the amount of actual tillage that we perform. So all these are reasons that people are interested in cover cropping. Another demonstration, this is from Southern Illinois in late January, early February. You can see the cover crop growing in that cornfield, not a lot of growth. Um, and it is raining, so we're seeing water running off that field. And if we just focus on this particular area, we've got a roadside ditch coming down. And you can see that the water that's coming off the field is cleaner than the water that's coming down the ditch. So just more evidence of why there's interest in cover cropping. From similar soil in that same farmer's operation, not that field, but uh, close by. A very heavy lower layer of soil constricts root development, but growing annual ryegrass, again, a, an annual grass as part of their cover, we can see that there is a root there, a little white root, and that begins the exploitation and the development of that that had not been exploited by previous cropping systems. Take a deep core and look at it. The soil characterization says that the organic matter layer for that soil ought to be at six inches and you can see where that is and yet we can see organic matter accumulating to a greater depth almost twice that. And this is after a decade or more of cover cropping, no-till farming. So we're increasing organic matter, which is clearly critical for soil 
health. And this is again, just looking in the deeper layers of that soil and how much root there now is down in that. And that's a function of the annual ryegrass, which was the chief component of this cover crop that this particular farmer was using. But then there's some interesting stuff. Now, again, this is just this is just cropping. We've not incorporated livestock into this system yet. And what this farmer is doing is planting annual ryegrass and then there are rows of forage rape in this. And as we begin to add different components, we see different response. And I'm not sure I can explain it, but every one of the forage rape plants that he was willing to pull up had an earthworm around the crown. I can't explain it, but it was there and we saw it. So there's this soil biology response when we start adding different components into these cover crops, which are already producing a benefit to soil health. But now the exciting thing for a forage agronomist is that we're, we're thinking that we're now seeing increased benefit when we graze cover crops in addition to what we were getting from cover crops alone, which were already producing significant benefits. So obviously, as Jack mentioned, we can meet nutritional needs of livestock. Um, we can reduce feed costs, which are a significant part of all operations. We can cycle nutrients to a better degree. These are all dramatic benefits. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we think we're starting to see, we're, we think we're seeing this increased biological response when we graze cover crops. And a critical part is that this offers the potential to increase income from a land resource where before um, it would be essentially a non-cash yielding part of the enterprise during that time. So Cover Graze is Baron Brooks program. We have what we like to think are superior crops. They are ideal for non-raising, but more importantly, they were developed as forage crops. And so obviously they would have an advantage in a grazed cover crop application. Uh, we have improved brassicas in a sense of turnips, forage rape, hybrid brassicas. We have improved annual ryegrass. We have improved legumes like bursine clover, other forbs, for example, chicory, I'll just talk briefly about some of those. Crop farmers are very keen to look for improved varieties or cultivars or hybrids. Um, not so much in forage varieties, and this is a quote that I like to use, uh, from the man who was, until relatively recently, the forage extension specialist, University of Wisconsin. Greater differences exist among grass varieties than among corn hybrids and soybean varieties. And yet the majority of the seed that's sold of these are of varieties that are at least half a century old. We have genetically improved varieties that we can take advantage of and we can demonstrate that there's a um, yield advantage and a financial return, even though you're buying a proprietary variety. Lots of reasons to look at annual ryegrass. That's been the basis of a lot of the cover crop work. A lot of root development from this annual grass and the wonderful thing about annual ryegrass is if we get the management right, if we get that grazing interval right, we can see that the rooting development under annual ryegrass, given the proper rest, will be equivalent to a non-grazed plant. Let me try to explain that again. If I give in this example, annual ryegrass, a 21 day rest period. Now this wouldn't be in the winter, this would be under good growth conditions, but 
you're going to see the same depth of rooting under that kind of grazing as you would see if you didn't graze it at all. And the benefit, of course, is every time we graze grass, some of that existing root system is now sloughed or no longer maintained by the grass because it now has to regenerate its leaf matter. It doesn't need all that root. And so that acts as a pulse of organic matter into the soil. So a big advantage to properly managing grass in these cover cropping rotations. Um, I mentioned we've got grasses. They can be short rotation, relatively long rotation. Depends entirely on the crop operation. Uh, for the most part, we're going to be talking about annuals. They could be cereals. They could be annual ryegrass. We have annual legumes as well. Bursim is one that we have. There are others like um, crimson clover, Persian clover, balanza clover. These are all winter annual legumes um, that have uh, value. A legume is a plant that supports biological nitrogen fixation. And so you can get an increase in nitrogen without having to use commercial fertilizer, but only if that feed is grazed or reincorporated so that the soil microorganisms can break it down and make that nitrogen available for a succeeding crop. There's also interest in using red and white clover, which aren't annuals, um, but there are interesting approaches. I've seen living mulches of white clover that are used as the basis for corn production. They'll go in and, and, and suppress strips and plant into those strips corn. Um, so a, a number of interesting approaches. Baron Brook can offer red clovers and white clovers that are adapted from Florida and Texas all the way up into Canada. Um, forage turnips, typically a single grazed crop. Um, is both the top and the bulb. Uh, you need to make sure that your grazing management, you don't get wastage of it. Um, but again, typically a single graze crop. I mentioned there's a yield advantage even over uh, um, not uh, proprietary varieties, common varieties. Uh, rape, I mentioned previously in the example, we have a forage rape that is fairly frost tolerant, meant to be grazed more than once, tremendous build over the common variety that people typically apply within cover cropping. And again, even though you're spending a little bit more, you do get a tremendous value from the forage value that we can calculate. Hybrid brassicas slightly, it has a small bulb, not as big as a turnip, but a bulb as opposed to the rape, and it can be grazed multiple times. These are crops that can be employed at several times throughout a grazing season, a growing season. So depending on what the farmer has in mind as a goal, we have tools that we can use, but again, management of the animals on this is critical to make sure that you get good utilization. I mentioned forbs, so these are now not brassicas, they're not legumes. Uh, things like chicory, interesting plant, relatively short life perennial. Uh, in addition to that, we have plants like plantain that are also forbs that have a role to play. We've used them a lot in pastures, but they could also be used in a uh, cover crop application. And there's some interesting aspects to these, for example, that seem to be altering the nitrogen metabolism within the rumen and shifting some of that nitrogen deposition more to the dung than to the urine, and so it's more stable within the succeeding pasture and cropping system. So those are some interesting things that we could talk about. 
just wanted to put out some ideas, run through the products that we have available with Barenbrook, and just emphasize that we can now utilize technology in the way of proof forages or in the way of uh, portable temporary fencing, water systems, management software. We now have the option of doing things that it's been very difficult for producers to do before. And I think it really opens up an exciting part of this cover crop soil health livestock enterprise discussion. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jack. Okay, thank you. Um, I just gotta um, bring up my screen here. Um, to the right slide. Somehow I wanted to start at the bottom. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So grazing management. When we're grazing cover crops, we're likely going to use one of two systems in our grazing. Either strip grazing, where we give the livestock uh, a strip of the uh, cover crop or the pasture each day or multiple times a day, depending on how we want to manage it. But it's basically a once over grazing system and each day they get a fresh strip. Or we may go to a one to three day paddock uh, situation to optimize utilization. In most cases, we're not getting any regrowth, so we don't want to waste any more uh, cover crop than we have to. We don't want it getting walked on, laid on, uh, urinated on, etc. So we keep it as palatable as we can and we offer it basically in daily or a couple of day portions as we move across the field. Fencing, um, in, for perimeter fence, likely two strands of electric fence for perimeter fence. Um, my definition of uh, perimeter fence is what lets you sleep at night. Uh, so that might be one strand, it might be three strands, but in most cases a two strand perimeter fence will work. Um, and then internally one strand um, with uh, step-in posts and that could be a turbo wire or poly wire on a reel. Uh, but that can be made, put up fairly quick, very quickly actually, and moved along as you go. You also need a sufficient capacity energizer to power the fence. We don't want the animals figuring out that there isn't much power on the fence and they decide to go through it. So um, there's a couple of options we'll talk about on, on energizing the fence. <clears throat> to figure out how big a strip to give or what size of paddocks, uh, you basically should estimate your daily forage needs. And I like to use 3% of body weight for dry matter intake. It's maybe a little bit better than, than some of the tables would suggest they need, but that allows for estimation errors and, and a little bit of wastage. So take the weight of your livestock times 3% will give you the uh, dry matter intake that you're going to need for, for, to support those animals. Estimate how much forage is available. Um, and if it's real lush growth, it's likely going to be less than 20% dry matter. And you could take a harvest a small area, a square foot or a couple of square feet, dry it down and see how much dry matter you have or estimate what is there if you were to make it into bales. There's different ways of doing it. And with that, you can set your paddock size or strip based on, on those calculations. So if you if you've got a, a 1,200 pound cow, 3% of body weight is 36 pounds of dry matter a day. I'm, I'm talking in pounds, not metric here. And then if for argument's sake, we had 3,600 pounds of dry matter available on that cover crop, that would mean that we could feed on one acre, 100 cows for a day or 50 cows for two days. So that, Kind of gives you an example of figuring out what size you need. So set 
set your paddocks up and watch the livestock for signs that you're over or underestimating. So you can adjust those paddock sizes as you go, depending on, on what the livestock are telling you. Um, here's an example of grazing fall rye, fall cereal rye uh, in the spring. And with sheep, this producer is using a three wire electric with step in posts. And he's getting uh, lots of grazing early in the spring. The rye, cereal rye, starts to grow earlier than just about anything else in the spring in our temperate climate. And so that gives his perennial pastures a, a bit of a head start without grazing there. And, and they can, then are stronger for the coming year. When you're grazing cover crop, we've got a, an oat or oat mix here. Be mindful of the maturity of that cover crop. Uh, on the left, it's lush and green or fairly lush and green. Seeing heads on the oats in the center picture, that's getting a little more mature than maybe what we really like for grazing. And then of course on the right, it's, it's dead. There's not a lot of feed there. So pick your times to graze where you're gonna get the the optimum for your livestock. At the same time, remember you've got the cover crop there for soil protection, so you want to leave some residue behind like we see in the right hand picture. This is kind of a, a different idea of a cover crop, and this is a, a producer who uh, frost seeded red clover into winter wheat. So winter wheat planted in the fall, the following spring uh, broadcast red clover into that wheat field, harvested the wheat, and then the following spring grazed it off um, and he was planting a, a later crop in, in June. So he had grazing on that red clover that was acting as a cover crop in that spring period and very lush, lots of protein here. You'd think there'd be a risk of bloat, but the animals started out on it fairly early in the spring and were used to it and did not have any bloat issues and a tremendous amount of feed there. And that was followed actually by a crop of edible beans in that growing season. Here we've got sorghum sedan grass and using Electronet to set up paddock sizes. Um, works something we would use with sheep. Uh, the Electronet works well for keeping the sheep in and, and provides some uh, predator protection and works well in that grazing situation. Grazing corn stover, really we don't think of it as a cover crop, at least not traditionally, but it's an opportunity to graze a crop a second time through the field. We've harvested the grain, there's a tremendous amount of forage there, and during that fall period and into the early winter, we've got an opportunity to graze. And again, the principles are the same as we've talked about, simple fencing, animals trained to electric fence, and you can provide extra forage or feed for your livestock in that method. And it gets you a chance to, if you haven't been doing any cover crop or corn stover grazing, corn stover is a great place to start and develop some confidence in grazing some of these different crops. Standing corn for summer to winter grazing, um, just again showing that there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in, in what you can graze and when you can graze it. Um, sheep grazing the corn and doing very well on it. Grazing turnips is going to be basically a one time over uh, program as Peter had mentioned. So using uh, strip grazing, putting up a single wire, they've got lots of forage there to eat. They're going to eat the tops, they'll eat the bulbs, and, and get a tremendous amount of feed from turnips in a grazing situation. But it is a once over scenario, likely for, for very late summer or early fall grazing is where the turnips fit in. And just another shot of turnips at different times of the year. Uh, the top right picture here, we've got them grazing up to a wire. They've been given a fresh strip and you can see the strips about 10 feet wide that they're getting and, and that provides them with a, enough feed for the day. There's that much growth there. 
on the top left, you can see the turnips, lots of top growth. The purple top is a softer bulb, and they can graze them right into the winter time, as you see here in this bottom picture. Uh, the turnips were used to supplement hay feeding during the winter period, and they'd lick away at the turnips and roll them out of the ground with their hooves and, and got some real value out of them. So again, showing that there's lots of flexibility and opportunities. And you can see in the top center picture where my arrow is going, uh, single wire step-in posts um, just makes it very easy to manage that grazing. Here are some grazing tools that people have set up to make it easy to set up fences. Um, top left is uh, ATV with a rack to carry a reel and, and posts. The same with the sort of the main picture that's hidden by the other three. This fella's taken a, a, one of those blue plastic storage tubs that you buy for $10 at, at a hardware store, cut it in half, screw nailed it to a board that was the right length that he can put the posts in, and they're held at both ends by the, the tub. Then he can put a reel in there and away he goes to do his fencing. Somebody's hooked a reel in the right hand picture on the back of an ATV. And the fellow in the center picture, he rigged up a trailer. He's got all his posts hung on the back of the trailer, uh, the reels on the trailer. He was a, a bit of a fanatic for doing things like that, but he got a system that he was really happy with and he had all his tools right there. Uh, to do is grazing. So lots of variety. It can be very simple and very easy to work with. So then we need to get some water to the animals, to our livestock. It's a lush crop and cool temperatures for the most part. So we're going to be mainly grazing cover crops in that September to November period. With that lush crop and cool temperatures, water demand by the livestock is not as high as it is in the summer period. So don't be afraid that of not being able to keep up with water. Um, we might use a permanent trough that livestock walk back to, a, a hydrant or a barn, um, or if there's a surface water adjacent to the area where the cover crops are, a creek or a pond, you might pump into a trough from there or an above ground water line that can be moved with the livestock. So just a black plastic pipe on the surface are all options for, for grazing. And if you, those don't work for you, a water wagon can be moved with the livestock. Could be a tank on a wagon, a water truck. Uh, if you've got a water supply tank for crop spraying that you're not using that time of the year, you could move water to the field where the animals are grazing. So lo lots of flexibility and water uh, to, to make the system work. Here's the heart and soul of the, the system. We need a reel and step-in posts. We've got the reel hooked onto a, a main wire here and then the step-in posts and, and the single wire running across. The ring top post that Gallagher has is very convenient to work with, wire moves through it very freely. The geared reel allows you to wind up the, the fence uh, very quickly. Basically, as you crank and walk across the field, uh, as basically as fast as you can walk, it'll wind up for you and you've got it <coughs> ready to string out again. Energizers for cover crops, it likely isn't going to be electricity readily available in the area. So we've got battery powered fencers, or solar powered fencers, energizers, to, to put a charge on the um, fence. Problems, common electric fence mistakes. There's a YouTube video with that name. And the three biggest problems are insufficient grounding, not enough power, and using the wrong wire. If we, we've got a wire that can't carry the capacity that we need, we can run into some troubles and I'll speak about that in a second here. Temporary post selection, we've got uh, posts here on the left that you uh, call double tread in that you can hook wires on at different levels. We've got the ring top posts, again they're tread in type posts, um, work very well. 
And in the bottom picture, we have the tumble wheel. Gallagher has a tumble wheel, which is basically six prongs on a hub. The, the electric wire runs through the center of the hub. And you just roll that fence along. You hold it tight, anchored on both ends. And uh, when you want to move it, you just unhook the reel at one end and walk it down your, your main fence. The, the whole fence rolls down the field and then you hook it up again. So a very convenient way to, to move fence and provide fresh feed to the livestock. Gallagher has a couple of new products on the, uh, on the market. One is the uh, heavy duty ring top post. So this is a heavier post than what we've traditionally had. And then added to that, we also have a multi-wire ring top post. So ring top on the top, and then a location for a second wire or a third wire on that post. So it gives you more flexibility in, in your fencing and, and how you set it up. I mentioned about the right wire. Our turbo wire has about 40 times the conductivity of poly wire. And I, for me, the best example is thinking of a water hose from when we think of electric fence. If you've got a half inch water hose, you can move a little bit of water a ways, but if you want to move the water a long ways, you just don't have enough capacity in that hose to move very much very far. So you get the bigger hose and you can move a lot more water. So the same with electricity, we want a wire that will carry a fair amount of electricity, especially for perimeter fences. And if we're going any significant distances, uh, certainly consider the turbo wire over poly wire. Poly wire works fine for something very short run, but it does have a lot of resistance in it. Um, and the more resistance, the, the less power you're gonna have on the fence because it, it is drawn down by that resistance. Fault finder uh, simplifies keeping your fence at its optimum performance. And the, the Gallagher fault finder uh, tells you the charge on the fence. It also will tell you the direction of any short that's happening along the fence and help you find it much easier. And here is just touching it to the fence, you get a, a readout of, in this case, uh, 6.5 uh, kV. So that's a good charge on the fence, which will keep livestock in. We've got a dual purpose handle for a temporary fence. The top end here hooked onto the fence um, gives you a, a, a connection to an electrified wire. And then we've got a connection end down here if you wanna hook onto a wire that is not electrified or would short you out. So you get, you can use both ends of this handle to make a very effective uh, temporary fence anchor or handle. And then just uh, innovations in cover crops. I put this slide in because there is information out there. Um, this one is, is from Canada, but it lists a, a great variety of cover crops that you then use, can use as a decision tool and it outlines what's the best time for planting, what crops they can follow, uh, best time for harvest as far as grazing or, or other purposes. Um, and we have one here in Ontario, and then there's a Midwest one that was developed by a couple of the universities and extension people in, in the Midwest of the U.S. So those are resources that can help you pick crops for your cover crop um, as you work into the ways of making best use of, of your land and providing forage for your livestock. Some of the Points to consider in grazing cover crops as part of an annual cropping program. Permanent corner posts in a field that's maybe grazed at future times is, is a great idea. About half the time of building a fence is involved in corner posts. So if you've got a, a field that you're gonna likely have cover crop in at different times in the next years, consider putting in the four corner posts and then you can quickly build the fence around that in the years and the time that you want to put in uh, a cover crop. Some cautions to be aware of, 
There is potential for nitrate poisoning in some of the cover crops, if especially new growth after a stress period. Um, it's something that we caution people on. Usually is not a problem, but something you just want to watch for, especially if the crop has been under some stress. And with sorghum sudan grass, there is the risk of cyanide poisoning after a frost. Uh, sorghum sedan makes a great cover crop, it makes great grazing, but once it, it has a frost, for the, a week to 10 days after that frost period, we run risk of cyanide poisoning, and that's fairly quick uh, death of the animal. So, but not a problem until we've had frost, and then after the frost, by say 10 days, it's not a problem again. So some fencing tips, um, livestock that have access to good quality fresh feed are content and won't challenge fences as much. If board and fence has a history of not working, they'll always be looking for an opportunity. And here we have a collection of bovines and I just, uh, the distant hills call to me, the rolling waves seduce my heart. Oh, how I want to graze in their lush valleys. Oh, how I want to run down their green slopes. Alas, I cannot. Damn the electric fence, damn the electric fence. And that's the key to good animal management. So I think that concludes my portion. Um, well, I think turn it back to Cody now, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Okay, well, I first want to start off by uh, thanking everyone for uh, taking some time to be here. I know that uh, given our farm and ranch clientele, it's not always easy to take time off to do this sort of thing, uh, especially at this time of year. But given that you have, I hope you found uh, something useful or at least something to prompt you to better prepare for future plans on your operation. Now, if you aren't familiar with Passion for Pasture, I'd like to explain what it is. Uh, we started this program a few years ago by Gallagher, uh, and it's an attempt to bring more awareness to the grazing community in North America. Our main objective is to train select Gallagher dealerships in pasture management techniques as a sort of train the trainer scenario. They then take their knowledge and deliver it to their local clientele along with the products like seed software and fencing products to make it work. The whole objective is to get the end user, like many of you here, to achieve more with less, a more prosperous operation with fewer input costs like feed, fertilizer, and machinery. With the objective of providing grazing solutions for a productive future to you, the livestock producers, and our customers, we hope we have teamed up with a few uh, notable complementary companies like Berenbrug and Maya Grazing to bring you a toolkit of products to make managed grazing uh, and planned grazing work for you. Now I know that this year has been a, a bit rough on many, uh, if not most regions in North America and for most of the agriculture industry. However, I do want to bring one thing to everyone's attention, which is kind of what prompted this particular webinar. As most of you know, it's been a particularly wet year this year in the U.S. And because there are many prevent plant acres uh, for corn, soybeans, and other grains, although the deadline to apply for USDA funding for prevent plant acres has passed on August 9th, uh, you should still be aware of the fact that the USDA for this year is allowing operations who planted cover crops under the prevent planting uh, funding to graze and harvest them starting September 1st, as opposed to the usual November 1st start date. Uh, so that might be something that some of you might wanna to talk to your local natural resources conservation service office about implementing on your own operations. So there is a, a list of eligible states there. Um, there's 10 states which are uh, doing that program or uh, have that program available to producers. Uh, and then additionally, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to some resources 
Passion for Pasture has two separate sites, uh, one for the U.S. and one for Canada. So you can see there for the U.S. is passionforpasture.com. Uh, and it, at these websites, here is uh, passionforpasture.ca for Canada. They're the same site, um, just you're able to locate your, your dealers respective to that country if you go to the correct site. Um, here you'll be able to find your nearest certified pasture pro to help out with pasture management plans and fence design and installation. And additionally, if you go to the home pages on either of them, you'll see this page. Um, and by clicking find a pasture pro, either here or here, um, you will be able to get to those maps, which, uh, uh, which you just saw along with a listing where you can learn more about each Pasture Pro location. And furthermore, you can find resources such as field days and other events hosted by our Pasture Pros, articles about other grazing, grazers' success stories, and a list of resources, which is where this recorded webinar will be saved. Finally, if you have any questions for Jack or I directly, you can email us. And uh, if you connect with us on social media, you'll be able to stay up to date with all the events and happenings and be notified about all of our future webinars. So if you have input, specific topics, or speakers you'd like to hear from, I'd appreciate those recommendations being sent to that email address you see here. And we're here to help serve you, so whatever recommendations you have, uh, we'd sure appreciate it. So that's all I have, and I wanna thank all of you for sharing your time with us. I think Victoria is going to go over uh, the Q&A session now. Thanks, Cody. Um, we will get to those questions in just a second. Um, I'll just uh, I'll do a quick overview of my grazing. So, for those of you who don't know about my grazing, we specialise in online grazing management software. My features record keeping, ranch maps, graze planning, charting, and forecasting to help you make more informed grazing. <laughs> Uh, My Grazing Light is our free product uh, available to sign up at any time on our website. This version is great for ranchers who are looking to have all their livestock records in one place and keep track of herd events such as sales, purchases and animal health treatments. We then have our professional product which is a monthly subscription service and comes with unlimited one-on-one -on -one support from our team to help you get the most out of Maya. On top of everything you get in light, this version has extra and more comprehensive features such as grazing plans, grazing charts, forecasting tools uh, to assist in maintaining optimum stocking rates. And you can see here this is what uh, my grazing look like on the web and on our mobile app. So now we might get straight into some of your questions. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A tab and just send them through and we'll get them answered. So we've got a question here from Bill. I've had horrible luck with annual ryegrass in New Hampshire. Are there varieties that perform well in short growing season areas, USDA zone four or maybe five? Well, there's a couple that we would suggest. Um, we have the ribeye that we mentioned. We also have one that's called Hercules. And I also understand that if you find true Italian ryegrass, there's a bit of confusion in the marketplace, but there, there is something called Italian ryegrass that tends to be more winter hardy. But the question still is, you've got this going into the, what, what kind of cropping system? I'll assume it's following corn. And in some places you just may not get much um, season following corn harvest for that to get established to get through the winter uh, especially if it's an open winter uh, and then you would have winter kill on it so in a situation like that you may need to be looking for something maybe that doesn't require that long a period and for those uh, I think the shortest option still ends up being cereal rye uh, Jack, do you have any thoughts on that from up in your part of the world? No, I, well, I, I would agree. Um, cereal rye likely, if you're looking for something for fall and, and um, following spring grazing, 
cereal rye likely would be your better option. Okay, sounds great. Uh, next question from Zach. In your experience, what is the best covers for growing stocker calves? Well, it depends on where you are because if I'm in the southeast, for example, there's an awful lot of annual ryegrass pasture where annual ryegrass is already overseeded onto something like a Bermuda grass warm season. Uh, perennial grass that goes dormant then in the fall and and so you have a longer more mild and so that works well typically that's combined with something like again crimson clover is very common but you could begin to build a much more complex system if you wished um in Sorry other to interrupt. just to let you know zach said he's from southern michigan um, so again, we, we could look at now we need to know, is it following corn silage? Are we getting it established into the stand during the time that the corn is growing? Or are we going to try to get it started after we've harvested the corn? I hate to be waving my arms and saying it depends, but these are the sorts of questions that we need to have answered. But for stockers, a good grass clover stand is ideal for putting gain onto stockers. And when we're looking at a situation where we're not trying to worry necessarily about pasture regrowth, as Jack described, and we're going to use it for grazing, we can even start looking for things like say a winter small grain with perhaps a winter pea or legume that would establish in the late summer and and survive the winter and provide grazing in this early spring. Okay great we have a question from southern New South Wales in Australia for soil compaction issues, is it best to use perennial grasses or brassicas? E.g. turnips getting a good run here in Australia, but herd perennial grasses are better to improve soil structure. Is that correct? Oh, I think you can, uh, I, I'll let Jack take a swing at this ultimately, but I think you can find things pushing in both directions. We've, we've had a lot of publicity because about radish, for example, because it, uh, daikon radish because it does have a very large root and it looks very impressive but I would agree that a perennial grass stand with good fibrous root structure is going to be hard to beat in terms of making a positive contribution to soil health to promoting good state water stable soil structure and putting a lot of organic matter into the soil. I, I would fully agree. If you've got the opportunity to use perennial forages, um, they're a, a better option than annual cover crops. If you've got the perennial grass and can you get a legume into that stand? That would be my, my first question for you. Um, you're literally hatting on the other side of the world from where I live, but there should be some legumes that would work in your environment and if you can add those to that perennial grass stand, that's going to be your, your number one from a soil health standpoint, from long-term productivity for forage production for livestock. <clears throat> Fantastic. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. So thanks for all those questions. Um, we'll finish our session here. I'd like to thank our speakers and everyone who joined us tonight. And we hope you got a lot out of this episode on cover crops. You'll receive an email at the end of this webinar with links to Passion for Pasture, Maya Grazing and Barrenbrug in case you missed that information earlier. So thanks again everyone and we hope you'll join us for the next episode in the Grazing Scholar webinar series. Have a great night.